So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our information session, introducing the new statistics and data science major. We are so excited to be able to launch this program for the fall and we'll start off today's session with Dr. James Scott, who was heavily involved in the creation of this major. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, so welcome, everyone. I'm very glad that, that folks could join on this, uh, at least here in Austin, beautiful Thursday afternoon. Hope I'm not distracting uh, too many of you all from outdoor pursuits uh, in the uh, lovely Central Texas weather like this or wherever uh, wherever you are in Texas or elsewhere. Uh, welcome. Uh, like Tommy mentioned, um, we are incredibly excited to launch this. Uh, just a, a bit about me. My name is James Scott. I'm a professor of statistics and data science uh, here at UT. Uh, and uh, this uh, new major really just represents something very exciting, both for our department and our university more generally. It's our first statistics major. Uh, we are joining many other universities who are recognizing the importance of this field for research, for industry, for our students, for thinking clearly about the world. Uh, what I was going to do here is just kind of start at the beginning, uh, not with the nitty gritty details of the curriculum, uh, but rather with a kind of a bigger picture view of what it is that you'll learn if you were to come major in statistics and data science uh, at the University of Texas. So let me just kind of kickstart a little presentation here. What are you going to learn to do? Uh, well, broadly speaking, there are three goals of statistics and data science, and I'll call them prediction uh, and classification, description, or causal inference. And yeah, those are uh, those may be familiar ideas, but we learn to do them quantitatively uh, using data in this field. And uh, if you kind of want a, a little schematic of what this looks like, uh, you know, these, uh, broadly speaking, are we talking about the past or are we talking about the future? And are we talking about passive observation of the world? Or are we talking about some intervention in the world where we go and manipulate things experimentally? Uh, and you can kind of see how these different ways of uh, thinking about the world break down into those two things. So description first. So here's here's a basic fact that comes to us from census data. A um, hundred out of every 206 babies born in America are female. There's no obvious biological reason why that would be the case uh, and not exactly a 50-56 ratio at birth, but it's true. And we know that by counting, by looking at census data and the millions of births every year and just counting the total number of female births by the total number of overall births. That's a really simple example of description in data science. Or how about this one? How about Americans' musical taste? Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a snapshot of a much larger data set. This is uh, 10 songs out of thousands of songs that appeared on the Billboard Top 100 at some point from 1959 all the way through 2021. Uh, and this data set, this is actually a, an assignment in, in a freshman level class in our, in our data science class, which is to, to quantify the musical diversity of Americans' taste in music over time. And it's just a fact that if you look at Billboard Top 100 data, that Americans' musical tastes are more diverse today than they were 20 years ago. And how do you measure that? You count, you take this data set that shows all of the artists, the week of the of the year, the year of the of the calendar, and you count the number of unique songs in the Billboard Top 100 every year by year. And you can see that, you know, it was about 400 unique songs back in 2000, 2002, and here 20 years later in 2022, it's nearly double, 800 unique songs appearing in the Billboard Top 100, greater diversity in America, greater diversity in Americans in musical taste. And that's all description, goal number one of statistics and data science, something that you'll learn to do from the very, very first day that you ever set foot in a classroom here at UT. Number two is prediction. And this is getting you know more advanced stuff. You'll learn to do a little bit of prediction early on, but this is a, a lot of what you are building up to in the kind of junior and senior year classes in the statistics and data science education. Here's an example of what I mean by prediction. This is a prediction that comes to us from Zillow. This is a, uh, that's a website that looks at prices of houses on the market. This house happens to be you know, kind of a nice looking house that I just randomly found on the St. Louis version of the Zillow website. So it's a random house in St. Louis, Missouri, and Zillow predicts that it would sell for $422,500 plus or minus about $27,000. Now that, that prediction, that number, it does come from data, but it comes indirectly. It's not as though that house has sold, you know, five times in the last year, and that was the variation in the actual sales price. Instead, this prediction comes by using data on similar houses, right? Knowing that houses that have similar characteristics in a similar area that sold at a similar time, what do they sell for? Uh, and, and from that data on similar houses, you can build a model, a statistical model that allows you to make a prediction 
for what this house is going to sell for, even though it hasn't sold maybe in 30 or 40 years. And that kind of prediction problem is core to what modern data scientists do, both in science and industry. Or this one, this is uh, would be maybe uh, a little bit of PTSD for anybody who lived uh, in Texas through the winter storms of 2020 and the power outages that were associated with that. This is data that comes from ERCA, the Electricity, Electricity Reliability Council of Texas, the the entity that operates the power grid in Texas. Uh, ERCOT has to predict how much electricity is going to be consumed next day, next week, uh, because firing up a coal power plant is not the work of a moment. They have to have some kind of lead time to say, well, we predict next week there's gonna be higher power demand. We had better prepare for that to make sure that the available supply meets the predicted demand for power. And again, that number comes indirectly from data. By definition, we haven't seen what's going to happen next week. But we can look at historical patterns, and in particular, in, a, in a, a climate like Texas dominated by air conditioning, we can use data on the relationship between temperature and power demand, uh, and this is specifically the Gulf Coast of Houston, to kind of make a prediction about what we think power consumption is going to look like next week. And, and again, this is the kind of thing that you would learn to do in a statistics and data science education is find those relationships and data and use them to build actionable predictions that would help scientists or policymakers or or just people that work at a power company make better predictions for their problem. Um, now we come to the third, which is we've covered description and prediction. The third is, this is the hardest game in statistics and data science, and it's called causal inference. Here's an example. Uh, this is a study called the PREDIMED study uh, it, that was done primarily in Spain, although also a little bit in Portugal. And according to this study, eating a Mediterranean diet, and this is this is more or less exactly what you get if you Google Mediterranean diet, you know, pasta, fish, vegetables, olive oil, those kinds of things. If you eat a Mediterranean diet, according to this study, it cuts your risk of a heart attack later in life by one third on average. And the, the ability to attribute that if you eat a Mediterranean diet, your risk goes down. The ability to actually make that cause and effect statement comes because this is experimental data. Actually, they, they did a randomized controlled trial assigning some people to the Mediterranean diet and some people to another data, uh, diet. And, this kind of causal inference where we want to, in this case, from reasoning from a cause, what diet you eat, ask what are the effects of that, that always requires some kind of uh, intervention or at least some hypothetical intervention, in this case, changing your diet. Or how about this one, uh, relevant to the headlines of today, gas prices. Um, this is also causal inference, but it's subtly different. So you may have noticed that, that gas prices went up at the pump a lot uh, for fairly obvious geopolitical reasons. So last month, gas prices went up by 5%. Uh, and it turns out that overall consumption of gasoline during that time went down by 4%. But if you, but if you trust what the economists say, they've read between the lines, and, and they've attributed half of that reduction, in other words, 4% reduction, they say that half of that was actually because of the increased prices. And the other 2% was due to something entirely different and coincidental to the increase in prices. Now that's also causal inference. You see some effect in the world. Hey, look, you know, we saw that consumption of gasoline prices went down by 4%. Why did that happen? What was the mix of causes that led to that observed effect in the world? And that's also causal inference. And we would call that causes of effects. And I say that this is the hardest game in data science, and it's a lot of what you build up to in a junior, senior year data science education, because it can go so badly wrong, as this next little uh, video clip uh, illustrates. Uh, I'm going to just briefly get out of the screen share, make sure that I've got the audio uh, portion of this uh, correctly done. Give me just a second here, and make sure I am sharing sound for this. Okay, so... Here comes the video. An Australian study in 2001 found that olive oil in combination with fruits, vegetables and pulses offers measurable protection against skin wrinkling. So then they give the advice, if you eat olive oil and vegetables, you'll have fewer skin wrinkles. And they very helpfully tell you how to find the paper. So you go and find the paper. And what you find is an observational study, right? Obviously, nobody has ever been able to go back to like 1930, get all of the people born in one maternity unit and half of them eat lots of fruit and veg and olive oil, and then half of them eat McDonald's. And then we see how many wrinkles you've got later. You have to take a snapshot of how people are now. And what you find is, of course, people who eat fruit and veg and olive oil have fewer skin wrinkles. But that's because people who eat fruit and veg and olive oil, they're freaks, okay? They're not normal. They're like you. They come to <laughs> events like this, right? They are posh, they're wealthy, they're less likely to have outdoor jobs, they're less likely to do manual labor, they have better social support, they're less likely to smoke. So for a whole host of fascinating, interlocking social, political, and cultural reasons, they are less likely to have skin wrinkles. That doesn't mean that it's the vegetables or the olive oil. 
And that's why causal inference is such a hard ball game because so many times we wanna understand what the effects of causes the cause of the effects are and we don't have experimental data. And one of the kind of cornerstone experiences of a statistics and data science education is learning how to reason effectively about cause and effect from non-experimental data. And so that's, that's a big part of what we do. So there you have it. There's prediction, there's description, there's causal inference, and those are the core skills that you get in a statistics and data science education. Uh, now, a little bit more kind of getting closer to the curriculum, although Tommy's gonna speak to this in a moment. I like to show this, this data science Venn diagram because it, it emphasizes the range not of like specific data sets or, or kind of broad skills that you learn, but more of like the actual tools, mathematical and computational tools that you learn. And, and I think data science really does sit at the intersection of these three circles here. There's statistics, there's coding, or the data science part of it, and then there is domain specific knowledge. And that means knowing something about a field that actually generates the data and generates the questions that you would want to answer using data, whether that's biology or astronomy or economics or uh, English literature, whatever it may be. Uh, so kind of on the, I'll just kind of take the stats and the coding pieces of this uh, independently because the domain knowledge that's, you know, you'll get that as part of your education here, uh, but it's sort of not for me to speak to. I, I can speak to the stats and the coding. On the stat side, um, maybe if you, many, uh, if you may actually be in an AP statistics course right now. And so you may be kind of learning to think like uh, the way that statisticians do. Um, if you ask a person on the street, what is statistics? They think of it as numbers, as data, as facts, and things that measure what we know. Uh, but one of the key messages that, that we will try to teach you if you major in statistics and data science is that statistics is also about measuring what we don't know uh, on the grounds that actually measuring what we don't know can improve our understanding of a problem. And for this, I like, I like to quote an old saying, I don't know who said this, but it's just something I've heard about watches, which is that a person with one, and I, I don't mean by the way, like an Apple watch connected to the internet. I mean like an old school watch with like a, you know, gears or a quartz a crystal or something like that. And the saying about watches goes like this, a person with, the wa with one watch knows the time, but a person with two watches is never sure. Okay, and, and why would that be? It's because a person with two watches can actually say something about how accurate watches are. They can notice, oh, my two watches differ by five seconds. They're both probably pretty accurate. Oh gosh, my two watches differ by five minutes. Maybe I should question the accuracy of watches more generally. And, and uh, you know, there's one watch and here's a bunch of people wearing two watches. Lord knows why Ted Cruz, Diego Maradona and Princess Diana have this fashion wearing two watches, but, but there they are. A person with two watches is never sure. Uh, so. Uh, if with two watches, you can see how they disagree with each other. You can learn how precise watches are. But if you trust just one watch, if you don't think statistically about it, you might be certain, and I put that in quotation marks about what the time is, but you're also uninformed. And the, the point of view of statistics is that it's better to be informed about what you don't know than have a spurious certainty in what you think you know. And then there's the data science side of it. And this, this is about coding, about getting modern computer architectures to help you work through the massive data sets and interesting, complex, uh, rich data sets that you'll encounter in four years of statistics, data science education at UT. And there are a whole host of reasons why you would want to learn to code independently of, of how, why uh, it's so important uh, in statistics. Learning to code makes you a more logical thinker. Learning to code will teach you intellectual self-sufficiency. You don't have to rely on what other people have, have said. You can actually go in and code it yourself and, and dive in and look at the data and check things. Uh, and of course, uh, it will also give you very, very career-ready data science skills. And, and for this, I think a little bit of data is worthwhile. We started collecting logos of people that, of organizations and companies that hire people that have data science skills in the two languages that you'll you'll learn, which are R and Python uh, in a data science education at UT. Uh, and, and well, you can get the sense from this profusion of logos that eventually we just kind of uh, stopped counting because it's sort of every organization out there these days wants to hire people with statistics and data science skills. Um, so, so that's my piece. That's what I wanted to say today, that there is uh, really an incredible opportunity to come to UT uh, in a, a new program, yes, but a, but a program uh, that is going to hit the ground running in terms of being able to teach you things that will make you better thinkers and more prepared to undertake whatever it is that you want to do in life. Uh, so with that in mind, let me, let me turn things over to Tomi, who's going to talk a little bit more about the specifics of, of the curriculum that we've designed for you. Yes, thank you so much. Let me adjust something here. All right. 
And I will share my screen, which will be, I think, less exciting <laughs> than what Dr. Scott has just shown us. Um, but as Dr. Scott illustrated, this is a discipline with skill sets um, currently in high demand in many, many industries. Uh, to give a very brief history lesson, at UT, various departments have been offering statistics courses since the early 1910s. But it wasn't until 2007 that UT established the Division of Statistics and Scientific Computation. In 2014, just seven years after they created this new home for us, we grew and became the Department of Statistics and Data Sciences that you know today. The growth of our department is aligned with the needs that we see in the world, and this new degree program was crafted in a way to meet those needs. The degree requirements of our new statistics and data science major consist of seven required courses in the major that students begin taking in the very first semester. They also take five foundational courses in mathematics and computer science, as well as four, as well as four courses for the breadth requirement, two courses of approved SDS electives, 10 courses of free electives, and 11 additional courses to complete the core curriculum. And that totals to 120 credit hours to complete the degree program. And there are a couple of items I'd like to point out here, the first of which is the breadth requirement. This requires four courses in a single field of study outside of SDS. This requirement was built into the program from the recognition that this discipline exists in an interdisciplinary realm. Statisticians and data scientists work in various fields. This breadth requirement is to ensure that our students learn in depth about a single field of study to complement the major studies, but also aligns with the potential career goals that they have. The second item I'd like to highlight is the free electives. In the same vein of interdisciplinarity, these free electives provide maximum flexibility for students to explore the application of statistics and data science through coursework offered by other units across the campus. Now taking these degree requirements, here we have the suggested arrangement of courses of how a student with no college level credit through programs like advanced placement or dual credit might complete all of the degree requirements within four years without taking any summer classes. Those of you who are um, coming into this program may be coming in with some college level credit um, and that will of course change how things are um, going to progress for you. Um, some semesters may have a lighter course load, or you may choose to take a core curriculum or an elective course that's listed later in the semester. Here, I've highlighted the courses that are the required major courses, that foundational mathematics and computer science courses, um, and those courses generally need to be taken during the semesters that they're listed here. The remainder of the courses that are not highlighted have more flexibility on when they can be taken, um, and that'll definitely be a conversation um, every time you meet with your academic advisor to figure out what am I gonna take for the next semester? What should I take? Or can I take some things during the summer? So those are going to be recurring topics that'll come up in your advising sessions. Um, are there any final comments that you'd like to make, Dr. Scott? Yeah, I mean, I'll just make one comment, which is that you know I, I perceive in some of the questions that we're getting in the discussion that there's you know there's a lot of anxiety about the choice to make, right? Particularly if you've kind of been accepted to a particular major and, and you're on the fence. And you know all all I'll say is um, you know I don't envy you that choice. Uh, and and kind of unfortunately that's that's life. Uh, you know there are very few uh, frictionless changes of degree or major uh, in an institution as large as UT. I mean we would love to have this. Uh, you know, kind of model of the medieval university where you can kind of move around and, and do whatever it is that you want at any time. But the kind of reality of a university in 2022 is that, uh, you know, it's a very highly selective place and all of the majors individually are very highly selective and they all have, uh, you know, kind of more people that want to get into them than they can. And so, you know, you just need to be realistic with yourself. Like this is, uh, it is a choice. It is not a frictionless move if you make this choice and then want to move back. And you need to acknowledge that and be honest with yourself about that. Uh, but but kind of the same is true anywhere you are at UT. You know, if you wanted to be admitted to electrical engineering and then change to aerospace engineering, that's not a frictionless move either. If you wanted to be, you know, admitted to the law school and change to the business school when you're 23 in a postgraduate, that's not frictionless either. So 
uh, there's just very few frictionless changes. That doesn't mean it's impossible, okay? So that doesn't mean that your choice is forever etched in stone and can only be that. You just have to be, you have to acknowledge reality about any frictions that you're going to encounter in, a, in any kind of bureaucracy as large as the University of Texas. So just, just recognize that and, and be realistic about it in your own thinking, but know that it's not an issue that is unique to statistics and data science. It would be true pretty much anything that you chose to major that if you want to change, yeah, it's possible, but that doesn't mean it's simply the wave of a pen and it's going to happen. There's a process to go through uh, and, and you have to follow that process.